Well, welcome everyone. This is Glenn Thompson. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. Uh, it's once again a pleasure to be with you. And uh, our topic for today is market math, the key to successful trading. As you see on my screen, uh, I've been working as a mentor with Pacific Trading Academy. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can reach us at the toll-free number 800-339-8588. You can also take a look at the website, www.pacifictradingacademy.com. Uh, some of you who have attended webinars in the past know, the, know the, uh, the, the protocol, and I see I've already gotten a question from Gary. My take on gold, uh, I'm long the metals. Uh, 80% of the time, just to quickly give you a, a little more background or context on your question, about 80% of the time there tends to be an inverse relationship between how the stock or equity sector moves relative to precious metals. 20%, uh, they kind of move in sync or in concert during periods of def uh, when you have extreme deflation and stocks go down, so too will the metals. When you have an inflationary environment or factor or components, uh, stocks tend to go up, so too do the metals. I think that's what's accountable for the pullback or the retracement we've seen in the last week in the metal sector, gold, silver, and platinum. Uh, gold, uh, or silver at least, rebounded a little bit today uh, and, and took back some of the losses that uh, had occurred uh, in the last couple of trading sessions. But I'll get more into that as we proceed. But again, most of the time they move inversely, but Maybe the question comes from the idea when you saw when you might have expected uh, a significant bidding up of metal prices uh, in response to the offering down of equity prices in the last week, uh, and you didn't. You saw them moving in concert one with another, and I, I would say it's, uh, it happens when you have extreme moves in a sector that are either inflationary or deflationary. Often you see the immediate knee-jerk response carry over into the metal sector and I think that might be at least a portion or a factor in why we saw the type of price action the last couple of sessions in gold and silver in particular. Hopefully that addresses your question. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, you can write comments and questions in the uh, area on the right side of your screen in the control panel area if I can address them as we proceed without too much interruption in the flow of the slideshow presentation. I will do so at the end. If not, we can um, we have time to provide more comprehensive question uh, responses. All right. Again, we're talking about market math, uh, and the title again is I believe it's a key, a key if not the key to successful trading. We are recording today's presentation, so if you want to review, you can access uh, the folks at PTA, um, and they will show you how to. Uh, get a hold of the archive where this presentation as well as all other webinars that I've done and as well as my coworkers have done I've actually uh, over the years um, I've actually been working with um, in teaching and mentoring and coaching and so forth for since the inception of PTA Pacific Trading Academy about 15 years ago I've been trading about 34 years so uh, um, there's a, uh, a spectrum of different topics we can discuss, but I want to focus on the importance in uh, how I see um, numerical and mathematical analysis, how it can assist us in our, our speculation. Um, so uh, um, if you can hear me, uh, assuming you can, and you can see the screen, we'll move on. From time to time, I may check in the midst of the uh, program to just make sure because we don't want any technical glitches. So let's see, um, this was actually a presentation I gave, I think, uh, more than a year ago, but I've added some new things that, uh, um, as conditions change, we want to make adjustments to reflect the most recent information and situations that uh, the, the financial markets present. So let's move along, and let's see. Wrong button. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Oop. Jump to that. In the beginning was the point. Uh, there was a famous mathematician, I uh, forgot who, uh, who, who, who exactly, but he said, God created the integers and man created everything else. So to, by analogy, uh, no one knows, you know, the, you know, part of our, when we get reflective as human beings, sometimes we think about the origins of the universe. And so there is the Big Bang uh, hypothesis or conjecture. So analogous to that, there is a point 
and a point kind of represents that initial kernel of whatever was before there was. Uh, so by analogy, there was the point, and so represented by, this was the only icon I could find in my uh, graphic program to illustrate this. In the beginning was the point. Um, so from there we want to move towards numbers. And next came expansion, and so if I point, if you imagine a point being the center of a circle, if you can see where my pointer is, no pun intended, on the screen, it would represent the center of that little circular geometric shape and figure. I submit, and I believe, if you think about it, I think you will too, uh, duality rules the day. Uh, I can't, uh, you know, from the point there came expansion, from the Big Bang, the particulate, whatever was before there was, um, it got lonely, or, or it was lonely, therefore uh, something else had to happen. This exemplifies a concept of duality, um, there or opposites. You can't have uh, a win without a loss. You can't have up without down. You can't have right without wrong. You can't have black without white. You can't have good without bad. I think the concept of duality uh, is central and facilitates existence, existence at large. Um, it is implicit in, in everything that I know and the things that I don't know. And um, so there was a point that preceded an expansion. The expansion comes about because of this implicit concept of duality. There must be, uh, there must be this tension, uh, otherwise you cannot have anything. Without expansion, without duality, nothing can occur. No, there would be no time, there would be nothing. Um, if we can just to make the point. So we have the point, then came expansion. If expansion were perfectly symmetrical and occurred in at the same velocity or rate in every direction, you would form a circle. Circle represents a very interesting and powerful geometric structure. It has infinite symmetry. But, um, and so uh, that's just a point I want to make, no pun intended again. And so numbers were born, and it never ends. The most basic and stable of all the numbers are the prime numbers. Primes are like the atoms, or if here in 2015, we have, you know, uh, years ago, there are even subsets or subcomponents of the atom, the electron, the neutrons, the subnuclei, or the nuclei of the atom, and even below that, they're quarks. Uh, so think of there are numbers, again, relative to the my opening statement, there was a fa uh, Kroniker, I think was his name, he said God created the integers, the numbers, all the positive counting numbers, all the negative numbers, um, zero it, 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 on the number line. Think of, I think of numbers as enabling us to do what divine, the, the, the divine, if you call it God or the divine or the universe, whatever your uh, narrative verbal word would be, whatever the language would be to describe an action. I think numbers on the one hand facilitate a number, they're multi-tasking uh, constantly. A number enables counting and therefore measurement. A number enables or, or implies an action. You can uh, stretch, you can expand. They're kind of, I, I always think of it in a mystical sense, as if a number facilitates what an alchemist would do, alchemy, transmutation, change. Numbers are the most basic, most general, at the, at the deepest level, uh, those entities which facilitate transmutation or change or what an alchemy, or alchemy. They, cre they allow what, uh, and, and at least in a potential sense, theoretically allow for what the divine does. Um, when God thinks uh, action, something occurs, or and so the number would be the uh, our analog, or our what would be what we would use as to facilitate <clears throat> what it is that the universe or the divine or God, whatever your word is, <clears throat> based on your personal philosophy or belief system. Let's say numbers are the instruments by which change occurs. They can through addition or multiplication. Um, division, subtraction, those are operations, if you will. But without the basic entities, the building blocks, the atoms or the quarks, if you will, uh, they uh, represent the the mechanism for transmutation. And so numbers were born and it never ends. The most basic and stable of all the numbers, again, are the primes. Uh, there is only one exception to this. 
One is, inter primes are those numbers, they are the atoms of the numerical kingdom, if you will. Primes are those numbers which are only divisible by the number one in themselves, you see. Um, and so they represent the atoms or the basic, most building, most deepest general uh, pr uh, important uh, uh, numbers. And so they are central to uh, a lot of everything at very deep, at, when you do, probe to the deepest levels of all that occurs in, a, in the universe, by this paradigm, at least if, you, if we agree with that idea. All right. Um, the primes orchestrate and regulate everything, even energy. So as a pun, for example, seven, eight, nine. I know it's an old joke, but I couldn't resist. Uh, eight and nine are not primes. Seven is. So it's the active number relative. It's active. It does something. It inherently, without having to do anything, does something. Whereas it does things that eight can't do and that nine can't do because they are not prime. And as such, a number such as seven, because it is prime, occupies a special place in the kingdom or in the pool or universe of numbers. All right. And so it was that certain primes determined that at the 24th harmonic of the circle, they would take a much needed rest. What do I, where am I going with this? I want to relate prime numbers to the circle. Again, we started with a point, which is imagine just the initial thought. It's the starting point, an analogous or akin to uh, that entity which was before there was anything, and in, in analogous to the uh, uh, the theory of, of 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 trying to figure out the beginning. What was be and and we don't know what was before the beginning. That's a uh, kind of a concept we can reflect on. But at some point there was a start. If, if we assume such, prime rep, prime numbers represent the analogy in our world. They again are the entities which are the active, um, allow for active change and, and, and adjustment in, in our universe. At the 24th harmonic of the circle, when the, when the duality, when it became evident that there, we needed to have some duality, there's a point and that's singularity. So implicitly the point understood, if you will, if you bear with me, if you go along with this line of reasoning for a few moments here, that it had to create uh, tension and create something other than the singularity and, and by m adjusting itself so as to expand uniformly in all directions, you created the circle. The circle is the most perfect uh, consequence of this uniform uh, constant expansion. It is infinitely uh, it has infinite symmetry, meaning that we can there there any and all adjustments you make to the circle, it still retains its properties, and you cannot you cannot tell that you have made any adjustment. If you rotate it, if you reflect it, if you revolve it, it still you can it it maintains its original state in spite of any adjustment, and that's what I mean by the infinite. Uh, symmetry, and as such, it represents a geometric shape supreme to all other geometric shapes. It turns out that when I speak of the 24th harmonic of the circle, that's a harmonic, for our purpose now, without going into too much detail, represent points of energy, of support. Think of the word harmony, just intuitively think and I, uh, of what that means. Harmony meaning that there is a constructive support or reinforcing. The 24th harmonic of the circle simply refers to that fraction of a circle which would represent 1 24th of the 360 degree circle. At that point, things tend to come to temporary rest. It's a way station. It's a pullover point, if you will, on your travel around the circumference of this geometric, supreme, infinitely um, uh, um, symmetric structure. And I'll explain further what I mean. But at that point, the primes determined where that would be on, on the location of the circumference of a circle. This is what I mean a little bit here. Um, I, I won't, imagine this circle here, and imagine these are the spokes of the wheel, these vertical cords or uh, diameters or radii, depending on how you want to think of them. But this is the center. This would represent the point, the circle, and any point on the circumference of such. If you were to rotate one of the diameters around its axis, around the center, and keep one of the other 
uh, diameter is stationary. Uh, imagine this were filled with charge. On one side of the line were positive charges, let's say, or let's say this is a region of positive charge between the horizontal line point, uh, going due east and west, and then this line go moving up at about a, whatever that is, a 40 or 50 or 60 degree angle, whatever it might be, a 45 or 50 degree angle. As you were to rotate this vector or this vertical or this line so that it came closer and closer, you would essentially squeeze the, the space that's present um, and eliminate and decrease the amount of space for charges to move. And this sets up a vibratory wave front. Um, there is no place for this charge to go at some point. At the point where this line is exactly superimposed on the horizontal, there's zero space. All of that charge must go somewhere and it, it must squirt across to the other side. It squirts through the center of the circle. The, the, the frequency is equal to the radius of the circle. That's why I have the R here to indicate this. That energy, if it, if it was a, 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 a field or a, a basket or a bucket of charge, if you will, would eventually squeeze out along the circumference of the circle. Some of it would go clockwise, some of it would move counterclockwise. By the time it moves three radius, it would end up at the fifth at the 24th harmonic of the circle it would be end up ending up about approximately 15 degrees away from what we refer to as the original conjunction the point of superposition of the of this line when it was perfectly overlaid on the horizontal and that's curious because the difference we all have heard from if you recall in was it junior high school math the the formula for the circumference of the circle equals uh, uh, the circumference equals 2 times pi r squared, if you remember that. So uh, the difference between the distance traveled, once the energy or the charge would travel around the circumference, uh, three, a distance equal to 3 radii, it would, act, it would reach a point exact or roughly, roughly about 15 degrees from the original point of incidence. And so the difference, that's 3 radius. Um, this point here, right here, represents a point on the circle exact, equal to exactly 3.14 the radius. It's one half of the circle. It's a semicircle. So the difference would be, as illustrated in this little arithmetic uh, division pro or quotient here, uh, is uh, roughly uh, it's four and a half percent. So if you take four and a half percent of the 360 degrees of the circle, you get 15.8. It's the closest whole divisor that that would round up to 16 but 16 doesn't move or divide into 360 evenly so the closest whole number that we can divide into the 360 between 15 or, or 16 would be 15 and so if you divide 15 into 360 it goes 24 times and this is what I referred to in the previous slide by the 24th harmonic it tend it's a point of rest um, in terms of entities, or in this case energy, to make the theoretical point, um, energy if it were to move around the circle would find a resting point roughly 1 24th of the, of the circle. And so that's important. It, it's not only important for financial market or understanding the principles that direct and inform financial market behavior at very deep levels, it's important for all phenomena that are dynamic in our universe, as I am aware of it. 24th harmonic represents a very basic uh, um, unit of, of energy reinforcement. Harmonics of the 24th harmonic then are themselves uh, somewhat more important than average. What are harmonics? Well, they're multiples, very often the number two. Uh, will, if, if, you multi if you take the number two and multiply it times something that is fundamentally intrinsically important, often you will get the octave or the, uh, another number that's uh, the doubling of that number or that thing that is also numerically important. Interestingly enough, the reciprocal of two, one half, is also. So, when you t so in this case, I've shown a spectrum of some, not all, of the important harmonics of the circle. 24 is the, what I consider to be a fundamental harmonic. One half of that, again, that's a, by taking one half, 12. Uh, 12, uh, 24 hours in a day, one half day, night and day, 12 hours. Six, a hexagon, creating, uh, breaking up a circle into six even divisions, uh, 60 degrees of P, uh, each. Uh, also, 
is, is a very critical. A hexagonal uh, reinforcement or harmonics create a logarithmic spiral that we see often in growth in living systems in our entire universe. The, the hexagonal logarithmic spiral describes the uh, the tangents and the uh, arcs of structure that we see on the on the one end, say in spiral nebulae galaxy, on an, on a macro level of thinking about it, at an opposite spectrum in the in the describing the curvature of this of this uh, 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 the shell of a snail, let's say, at a very much small at a micro or in the opposite direction, and then one half of six three. Uh, the uh, uh, providing or imputing the importance of triangles in uh, the world that are both static and dynamic. Triangular structures, the double triangle, uh, the Star of David, uh, triangle, triangles tend to uh, be very uh, supportive and reinforce energy. Uh, so this is just a theoretical um, bit about numbers and the harmonics that derive from the circle. And again, all of this comes from the point the singularity, but the point by itself remained dormant, and you need duality. Remember my narrative at the uh, at the first when I was still just giving the introduction. I said nothing can exist, even time, if you have merely have singularity and as a theoretical concept. There must be opposites or duality. I can't have hot without cold. I can't have pain. You know, I can't have sickness without health. Um, there, you can't have good without bad. If you have singularity, there, you have nothing. There is no meaning. You must have a duality of concept to create, to impute meaning to anything. So this is that would be the imperative and the and the motivation for a singularity, a single uh, thought or a single was before there was to create something. There must be expansion, thereby allowing for the duality. It turns out once you have the, the expansion, and in, in a theoretical sense, providing a circle, that's the most ideal uh, end point of an, of an initial expansion, we want to find, and it's curious and interesting to learn about the points of reinforcement on this uh, uh, infinite uh, um, symmetrical structure. And ever since, there has been nothing new under the sun. Uh, there may be in our physical universe and financial markets are a subset of that things that look new, but in in our narrative and our language, um, it all it, all of this, if you probe deeply enough, it stems from numbers, even the ge the geometric shapes. Geometry is a higher level of numerical uh, the numerical building blocks, and I submit that primes in particular are more special. They represent the atoms of everything in our universe, in a sense. And there are even within the primes, I don't want, I'm not going to get into this today, there are special, there are primes that, are, there's, a, there's a strata of hierarchy among the primes. Not all primes are created equal. By the way, there are infinite number of primes. Um, and we don't, I don't understand the primes in the same way that scientists don't always understand the substructure of our building block, the atom, we do to a certain extent. Uh, as far as I know, you know, they've got it down to the quarks, and there and there are different types of quarks. Some there's a hierarchy of importance. You got up, down, strange, etc. You got the bosons and the hadrons and everything. But and so we're constantly uh, peeling back layers of the onion. Even in chaos, primes being ordered. And the reason I bring this up, and and folks, if let me just see here. I know I haven't shown a price chart yet, so you might be wondering how I'm going to relate this to the price of gold or the price of or what's going on in the stock market or the bond market so just hold on I'm just providing <laughs> seriously <laughs> okay seriously yes seriously Joe and uh, it maybe it's too serious but in any case um, chaos uh, financial markets let me bring it back uh, so I can be t uh, a little more serious for people like Joe who uh, maybe think I'm joking so um, Financial markets are extremely complicated, uh, and if it weren't so, uh, I might not be doing this presentation because it would be obvious to everyone how you can exp uh, interface with a market and uh, at, at your capricious whim decide to take money out of the market. That's the whole reason uh, we employ and utilize various indicators and analyses to try and get edge and acquire edge. Uh, we are in a very complicated 
uh, field, uh, I again, going back full circle to my original premise, theoretically, uh, refill that numbers will provide a key to this. Um, there is a, um, what's known as a fractal, and this is called the um, Sierpinski triangle, and in spite of the infinite degree of complexity that you may see uh, in a financial market, trying to figure out what's going on or trying to make sense of it on whatever level you do, I submit that, yeah, there is infinite possibility, but fortunately for us, to in order to get a handle on the chaotic complexity that often we see in financial market structure, there is some rhythm, there is a pattern. Uh, we refer to, I refer to what um, uh, fractals, things that are uh, very complicated systems often have what re uh, we scientists and people who, and analysts and market researchers refer to as attractors. What is that system, let's say, be it the S&P, be it the Apple computer, be it uh, soybean, what is that system, is there something to which its motion and behavior is attracted? Is there a pattern that we might discern amidst the complexity. If you can discern this pattern, you get you automatically are beginning to acquire some edge versus or relative to the other market participants that are not able to discern such patterns. The Sierpinski triangle, which is I've shown you various pictures on the screen here that are illustrative of that, often show this. Here's a very simple he did a he did a study and he did it on a computer Let's play a game. It's called the chaos game. If you were to uh, just create three points on, uh, on a plane, just draw three points uh, and label point one, two, three, the vertices of a triangle, and say point one, or let's say A, B, C, A, B, C. Let's label them with letters, marking the three points, and they're all an equal distance away like this, so we create a triangle. All right. If, if point A is if we if we assign a, an ordered pair one two if we and call this point B that would be three four and this would be uh, point C that would be five six so one is or so A let, letter A or one of one point of the triangle would be assigned the ordered pair of one two letter B at the other uh, point of the triangle would be assigned the ordered pair of three and four and point C one other the final point of the triangle the third point would be assigned the ordered pair of five and six. Imagine we come in with a fair die and roll the die. We play a game and we constantly roll the die. You then select, that's your playing board, that's your field. And so within the confines of the triangle that we have designed in the way I'm, I'm in our little thought experiment here, this is not a chart, uh, whoever's asking, this is an example to illustrate the chaos and the complexity of financial markets. I have a number of charts that I'm gonna illustrate um, and this is why I do the presentations uh, to hopefully give you some edge. Um, anyway, if you were to uh, arbitrarily at random select a starting point, so just designate and mark off a point uh, in this inside the triangle, and then by flipping repeatedly the die, just a single die, you're going to get one of six numbers coming up. Whatever number you get, move uh, from your starting point wherever you start. And by the way, the selection of your starting point is purely random, unknown. It, 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 uh, uh, however you come to it, arbitrarily designate anywhere within the confines or internal to this triangle, you, put, you, you, you make a point. And then you move from that point to additional points by virtue of rolling the die. Whatever number you come up with, you move one half the distance towards that number. Remember, the top of the triangle, let's say, is ordered pair one, two. This would be the one side of the triangle, another point of the triangle would be three, four, the other point of the triangle would be five, six. All right, having moved one half the distance, so you start anywhere you choose, and whatever number comes up after your roll, just go move from that point on a straight line, one half the distance to that number. So if I roll six and I start at my point, say at the center of the triangle, I'm gonna go half the distance to here, to point where point six is. And then you compete that, you, com you, you repeat that process, you iterate that function. So let's say you do that 10, 50, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 times. You will eventually, regardless of the order of events, 
meaning the order, the order of numbers that you come up with, you will always end up, no matter what, with what you see here, a series of embedded triangles, infinitely. By the way, every time you, there's zero probability of you ever having a spot inside of any side, inside any of the triangles that are embedded within the large, the starting triangle. Zero chance for any marking to ever be made in any of these. So you have a finite boundary, that is the triangular structure, and an infinite number of solutions. I merely point this out to indicate that that's the best we can do in analysis of markets. The best I can do uh, is understand that there I, can, I know where the solutions lie. So that enables me to project in both time and price where our market's going to go in advance of it actually moving there. But I don't have perfect accuracy because I have a finite range of possibility, but I, within that finite knowable range, I have an infinite number of possibilities. And thus, that's, that's a, in a broad generalization, a way of describing why or indicating why we have the challenges we have in analysis uh, in, in trying to figure out a market structure analytically saying nothing about other aspects of the process of speculation. Harmony, harmonic proportion, the ratio of, ratios of differences. There's arithmetic proportion, which really highlights and talks about differences. Uh, there's geometric proportion and there's harmonic proportion, which in, is a ratio of the differences. And we find this often in things like music. We find it in financial market structure. Harmonic proportion is also a mathematical ratio of price intervals, the differences in financial markets. Um, a lot of this I learned from people like Joe DiNapoli and Connie Brown. Um, so it turns out I'm not going to, uh, since most of you are eager to get to the meat of this and the charts, uh, one is that is that important, although it's not prime for various reasons, even though it's only divisible by itself, the reason it's not prime is because I can, uh, it has, it's not, it's multiple by one by one by one by one by one. So it's unique. One is singularity. Um, so it's it has the a proper properties of prime numbers, but it's not considered prime. Nine eighths, it's uh, what's considered a whole tone. Five fourths, four thirds is very important. That's the uh, perfect fourth. Three halves, the perfect fifth. This is the octave, two to one. These are just fractional harmonics that are very important uh, from a harmonic uh, proportion standpoint. It turns out there's an in, those of you who are utilize Fibonacci analysis, uh, three halves is very interesting. It's the fifth, and it's uh, notice that in order to create the fifth, we're using Fibonacci numbers. So I'm just pointing out a quick relationship there. These are key turning points in stock market. This is a chart I took out of one of uh, aerodynamic trading material, illustrative of the S&P. This is some years ago. Um, very often, a doubling, when you, through matrix math, double, or you have a perfect fifth uh, that is composed along with a perfect fourth, you get an octave, and very often moves will be a uh, entire market moves from a bottom to a top or a top to a bottom will consist of both a perfect fifth and a perfect fourth as in, il illustrated. And this is old history. This is a monthly chart, long-term chart in the S&P a long time ago. So it's, this is just what I was referring to. I'm not going to get into that. But the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth often indicate to us order amidst the complexity where I can understand why a market has moved from one point, I'd say a bottom to a top or vice versa. This is just another example of that. The most important ratios, I don't want to spend too much time, I want to go to what are you'll probably consider to be uh, important. The most important ratios are the octave, two over one, the fifth, three halves, the fourth, the four thirds, and this is the whole tone, nine eighths. These are important harmonic ratios that I enable me to make in both price and time, significantly accurate forecast or projections. This is a chart I printed out yesterday. This is the bond market. So I'm going to stop here so everyone, you can relax. We're now on a chart, and I can bring this back down to terra firma here. And you see in the real world. Um, this is this bottom right here. Please, please excuse my uh, lack of perfect uh, graphic tools. I did this by myself. Normally, I have assistance from our computer people, so I apologize for the imperfection of uh, artwork here. In any case, this is the bottom on June 26, and this is this was the beginning of today's session. This was the overnight session. I printed this out last night. 
This vertical line right here with the date, September 16, represents my projected theory. Next time I projected the market, the bonds will turn, September 16. It's a theoretical projection that I've made. Uh, and I probably have about 87% confidence that that will occur. The market will turn on or around plus or within a three-day window, in this case, uh, of 9.16. Um, this illustrates the harmonic. The entire move from the bottom on June 26 to right here, this, the bottom that came in, this bottom right here represents Monday, the 24th, a few days ago, this past Monday, August 24th. That's a perfect fifth, three seconds, or three halves, which is the, called a perfect fifth. It's a, uh, an important rational harmonic. This is this move from this bottom here, the same price level at which the market formed a bottom this past Monday, August 24, through the top is, it's not perfect, but more or less it is a perfect, what's called a fourth. So the, 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 the fifth and the fourth composed or added together enable me to generate a price target where I can expect this thing is going to go. This is interesting because the preceding slide, if you, let's see if I can get back there. This, in, in the, in the S&P move uh, from long ago, we had the, we had the fourth and then you had the fifth. Sometimes the, it doesn't matter the order in which they occur. Sometimes the fourth will precede in the move the fifth. Sometimes the fifth in the move will precede the fourth. In this, so in the movement of the S&P long term, this was, this was back, this top here is back in 07. This is back in 2000. This is back in, or this was 2002 if I recall. This was 2000, this was 2000 back here. All right. Sometimes, I'm just pointing out here the, the perfect fourth portion of the entirety of the octave, the doubling of price action uh, preceded the, the, the fifth. Uh, aspect of the move, and so currently, what I've found or is is operating in the bar in our bond market right now, we have the fifth, the three halves, rational uh, harmonic uh, preceding the and that was the start of the move from the bottom on June 26 through uh, actually where we came into some resistance here, and again we re, we gravitated back towards that resistance this past Monday, and that was this was an important bottom, I believe. I've been telling people that I consult for the last couple of weeks uh, to utilize, and I'll touch, I'll use this, bring up this slide and a few additional slides again to show that I am utilizing and depending and hinging on the bond market to enable me to make a forecast about the stock market and broader and other financial or paper. Or, or financial markets in general. As the bonds go, so too will does money in, in an inverse sense. But I believe what's at work here is uh, you can clearly see the harmonic motion of the market. The market retraced back um, based on where we are. This is as of last night when I printed it out about 8, 9 o'clock. Uh, we actually uh, are trading at, um, in the bonds about an, uh, 40 minutes ago, about an hour ago or so. Um, at about 156 area uh, in price. And let's see if we can, if I have the scale over here. Yeah, 156. So we're kind of, we're just in and around the same area at least about an hour or 40, 50 minutes ago that we were last night. So it hasn't much, much, we haven't seen much movement. I think it's down a little bit. The stock market is up considerably, or mar stock markets, I should say, or indices are up considerably today, as you'll see, or as you, you may be aware. Um, but in any case, as typically, bond markets are going to lead, they're out of phase, but they're leading uh, stock prices. And every now and then, there's an inverse relationship, but more often, they are leading. So uh, I am bullish the bonds. I believe that quite possibly the bottom that came in this past Monday will mark the end of the retracement. I look at everything from this bottom on June 26 through this top that was probably the 18th, corresponding with the top in the stock market last week the 18th of August, and then the pull, the little re bit of retracement. This, again, is our time point. I expect overall, I don't think it'll be day-to-day-to-day, -to -day -to -day, perfect uh, succession of higher and higher highs, but I believe that the trend between now, right now, today is the 27th, and September 16th will be higher. That's just my thought. Think about interest rate monetary policy anyway. If you want to, I you can on that level. If you want to go deeper, look at the chart, understand these harmonics, and that will enable you to make sense of the complexity and understand what's going on. All right, 
So this is just a heart illustrative, illustrative of recent activity in the bond market, and I clearly see if, uh, if you were to take the low price here, which was 155. So when the market was moving up off this bottom on June 26, it ran into resistance at around the 155 area. Notice the notice this horizontal. Notice where it is, just 155 in chain, or just below in that area, 155. If I measure this distance, the low. At 147, there's a, a change of eight units or eight eight handles, as they say. And if I take the four thirds or the perfect fourth of that, I get 1066. I add that to the 155 area, and I get a price target of 166 for the bonds. So this enables me to come up with a very I will, well we won't know I, I unless you know. But my theoretical target is 166. And this is the bonds. This is the September bond contract. We're about to expire at the end of this month, so we'll be shifting over into the new month, into December, uh, as we approach or rolling over as we approach the expiration of the near of the front month. But 166 is a target. Look at where that is on the scale here. So it's quite possible, or plausible at least, that I might expect a bond nominal price target to move into the area or approach as an as the Serpinski triangle. 166 as a number is serving as an attractor to the market, as is this time point, 916. What did Gann say? When price and time square or when they come together, you have your best trade opportunities. Uh, whether you're on the sidelines watching this or whether you're long in the market from this point um, and you want to figure out how to make adjustments to your position to the extent you, have an, uh, you understand the deeper framework and attractive uh, structure and the grid within which from the standpoint of both price and time you have a better uh, capacity to make more efficient more relevant adjustments to your position if you're on the other on the other hand if you're on the sidelines and you're looking for a trade and you're willing to wait till another uh, what is it two weeks now or two or one uh, just about or a little more than two weeks whatever it is you can look to go short as we approach this um, point possibly and there that's all other variables fixed for the moment. I'm just saying, given the, the relationship in terms of my price target with respect to the time point here. All right. This is uh, Stanislav Ulam, mathematician back in the 60s, did, you know, some of you may think this is a GAN spiral or the GAN square of nine. It's, it's the same idea. It's only going uh, counterclockwise. The GAN square of nine is a... Uh, clockwise uh, number wheel uh, along with a, uh, a numerical and astrological calendar. This is just a pure number wheel. The difference between it and this, well, one of the differences between it and the square of nine GAN tool is that it's mo the numbers are, are moving counterclockwise. Uh, starting at one, that singularity, that's the point in the center and you could, if you imagine, if you could pull this up out of the plane, imagine thinking in 3D, just imagine applying a, a depth to this, imagine these are the four bases of the pyramid. It could be a tripodal pyramid, or in this case it would be, a, uh, what is that, a quadrupodal uh, pyramid. In any case, this would be the, uh, the center point or the apex or the top of the pyramid, and then these would be the four bases, the cardinal and uh, uh, in, and the uh, uh, points of the pyramid. But in any case, this is a normal number number spiral. They've been in use and application since antiquity. But in any case, what he did was he eliminated, come down here, this is the same spiral, same set of numbers, minus, uh, he took out all the numbers that are not prime. This is just, these are just all the primes. And it just goes on into infinity. You can carry it out for as long as you'd like, or as long, uh, for however many primes. That's interesting. It turns out, let's see, oh, let me just explain this. If you then uh, were to eliminate all the primes, remember a few minutes ago, folks, I said that there are there's a substrata, a hierarchy of more, uh, there's some primes that are more important than other primes. There are things called Mersenne primes. If you only left, or if you rather, or let me restate it, if you eliminated all primes except those primes that are, uh, that are touching uh, on all sides two other primes, then you're going to end up, well, first of all, before you do that, I, I forgot. I, I forgot. I left out a step. I'm, prime's working overtime. That's what I'm saying. This is what you get after about, uh, w w if you just run all the primes out and you just kept doing this and doing this, uh, you're going to get something that looks like this. Prime's working overtime. 
And when you eliminate all the primes except, uh, except the Mersenne primes, only those ones that are touching uh, two other primes, uh, eventually from this structure, this is after you've done this about 40, 50,000 times. So this would be done on a computer. This is what I, and I just refer to it jokingly as a working overtime. There's constantly, and you can see some structure in this, even though you can see the di along the diagonals uh, clustering. So there are some patterns, even, it, it, even though on, a, on first glance it might seem like complete utter mess. You know, make no sense of it, but I do see some structure. But if we make some adjustments and only focus on those primes that are even of, in the hierarchy of importance of primes, you end up with a logarithmic spiral often a pattern we see in nature, break time for primes, where we've owned these, the, the spiral that we see at the center, like the eye of a hurricane, the, cent, the eye or the center of a spiral nebulae galaxy. Um, do you see this pattern in pineapple or in the, in, in the flowering of various uh, natural phenomena in, our, in the vegetation world? But this is not, you see it in the spiral in certain hair patterns on a, on a person's scalp sometimes. You see this. It has to do with, and it's ultimately directed by prime numbers, and in particular certain primes. Uh, so numbers are at the root. It's not, it's not a coincidence or just a random chance that we often see uh, phenomena in our natural world moving in according to these and creating these geometric structures that are so clearly obvious to and that stick out and are not a, a hodgepodge of random price activity or, or phenomena, but rather clearly indicate definitive structure that sticks out and is meaningful to us. And so we see it in a flower, we see it in, in, this, uh, in this spiral nebulae. And this, we arrived at this simply by iterating the, the, number, the number spiral and by only selecting and leaving certain primes of that, which are of greater importance than other primes. Conjunction power. This I should have actually had this slide early. This is what I was referring to when we were talking about the importance of the 15th or the 24th, or the 15th degree of a circle being the 24th harmonic of the circle. I should have just. This is just the theory. I don't think I will bother with that. I think that was pretty boring, I guess, for you guys. So, um, logarithmic spiral. <clears throat> this is just the pattern that comes about. That same <clears throat> spiral that we saw is due to uh, the fact that you. Uh, this is, uh, you, you see it with Fibonacci numbers, uh, you see it with certain, certain specific primes that will have the net effect of creating a hexagonal structure, and if you were to draw a spiral using the vertices of a hexagon, you will create this logarithmic spiral that is so important to systems that are in nature, that are exhibiting and needful of growth, and that exhibit growth. <clears throat> the sixth harmonic, it turns out, stimulates growth and development of all life. So very often uh, you, you'll see this. It's not coincidence. And we see this in market behavior. There are elements of, uh, you know, uh, Elliott Wave and of other models that define and uh, describe market motion, uh, which if you look more deeply, you will see uh, harmonics, uh, the sixth harmonic in particular. And if we, under, if we want to know why the sixth harmonic is so important, Note, this, is, this has to do, this is a little, a little formula here, a little equation. The radius grows exponentially with the angle. This happens to, this just is the formula that defi defines this geometric spiral structure. The angle between the tangent and the radius is constant. And uh, it turns out that the base of this, uh, this number is often a prime number. So in very subtle ways, uh, we find prime numbers informing, directing, orchestrating the structure at very, very general and deep levels. If you don't look, you won't know, but often the, the, uh, the degree of abstraction that's required and necessary to see this and conceptualize and comprehend it is challenging. That's the problem. That's the maybe the roadblock. It takes, we don't normally think. This is why I think, you know, we progress from the thought or the mind of God or the universe or the, or the divine and then, then, and then, like, again, coming full circle back to the premise I made, the famous mathematician, I think it was Kronecker, said, God created the integers and everything else was man's work. All right. So what you get by trying to get a glimpse of the divine is the next, the interim step, if I can't see and understand and comp comprehend and, in, and intuit the divine, he gave us numbers 
as the next, as the interface, as the liaison to the divinity. The problem with that is, and it, it's not easily accessible. There is a modicum, a degree of, of abstraction that is required to see the relationship that a number, a numeral, one, a digit, and these are just the normal integers. We haven't said anything about, there's all sorts of numbers. There are negative numbers, there are positive numbers, there's one, there's zero. There are imaginary numbers. If you remember in high school math or junior high, whatever it is, remember, my, i equals the square root of minus one. That's an imaginary number. There are irrational numbers, but I, am, I submit that primes are the building block. They are the most, the deepest numbers. They allow access and they allow you to understand. If we take the time to reflect on them a little bit, I believe that language came about because it's less general and it's more accessible. We all deal in it 24 seven. But with that ease of accessibility, that's the benefit. We have ease of accessibility when it comes to human language, let's say, or any type of language, human or otherwise, let's just say. The benefit, the strong point, the pro of language is the ease with, by which we can access it and acquire it and utilize it. The downside of language is the variability of, under, of interpretation. It creates ambiguity. Likewise, or juxtaposed to this numerical thought, a number, numbers, primes in particular, much, much, much more abstract and therefore much, much more general and therefore much, much, much more constant. The meaning of a given number is constant through, through time or if I want to relate that to price, uh, financial market through price and time. The meaning of a number is exactly the same today as it will be 10 million years from now. The meaning of a word that we think of as a, a, as a component, as a building block of language, may or may not be, have this be constant today, may not be the same today as it is next week, next month, next year. So n numbers in particular, and even if you want to go deeper, primes, I believe, are the building blocks. They are the quarks or the atomic structure of everything. So to the extent we want to understand anything complicated, such as a financial market, I want to understand the basic constituents of that market. Yes, it takes a little more reflection. We've got to go there. But to the extent you do, you, you're able through the constancy and the degree of broader, much broader generalization. You are short of one thing, it's, it's going to remain constant. It never changes. All right. Whereas language is so variable, you never know uh, what was in vogue today may or may not. What's, there are new words constantly coming up all the time. There's, no, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to numbers. Specific evidence of primes. The one twelfth root of two is an important number for the octave doubling. I will, tant well, I, will I will dangle that out there for you without showing you what that is because um, I don't want to give away all the things. Uh, but that the one twelfth root of two enables me sometimes with extreme accuracy to project both in time and price when a market's going to turn. I could not do that if I just looked and utilized the standard fare of tools that most traders use, moving averages, oscillators. To the extent a moving average or an oscillator, be it RSI, stochastic, you name it, works at all, or a simple trend line, is the extent to which it has some, at, a very, at the root level, some dependency on a number. And very often, if you dig deep, it will be a prime number. And it might even be deeper than that. It might be a, a particularly important prime number. This number, 142, or point, excuse me, 0 0.142 or 142857, can be used to project harmonic points. I enable, I utilize both of these. There are two different ways, and both of them are curiously, I'm not sure if this number is prime, actually, uh, it's not. I don't believe it is. Yeah, it, it, I don't think, yeah, I'm, I don't believe that number is prime. Uh, in any case, I use both of these numbers to enable amazing accurately accurate forecasts in both price and time. Uh, those of you who've attended some of my webinars in the past understand that from a cause and effect or fundamental standpoint, I believe time is more important 
that's I, I that's not really true. I say that to emphasize the importance that I place on it to to offset or to provide a countervailing concept because I understand and know that most traders focus solely on price. There are you know I always tell the people I consult probably whatever not more than about five percent of traders in the world apply time market timing um, to analysis. I think more, a more precise statement is to indicate, as Gann did back in the early 1900s, the equivalency of price and time. They are two sides of the same underlying physical phenomena, price and time. I, do I look at a market motion on a price chart at, from the perspective of price, which is what most traders do, and then they stop there? Or, and or do I look at it, and I, as I believe one should, to get more information, con, uh, interpret the price activity or the market motion rather from the perspective of time. You should in a perfect world I think look at it from uh, both perspectives. It's an energy curve and it's merely a graphic representation of the collective of all energy uh, representative of views, the resolution and the netting out of all the views of all the participants throughout the world that are following that particular market. All right, let me stop right there before I go to specifics here. Right. Any questions, folks? This, that was the theory. Now let me give you some specific uh, points here. All right. Charts. Let's go to charts. Dollar yen, Japanese yen. It doesn't matter. There are lines on a screen from a technical standpoint. Uh, if you choose to think of them that way. If I want to entertain and get into all the nuances at very high levels, the superficial levels of what the news concerned concerns with. Um, I read a report on a financial website this morning. In light of the rebound in equity prices worldwide today, stock markets began to be bid up. Traders were buying because they perceived value. Uh, a central banker at the, at the Fed, the Federal Reserve here in the U.S. said, ah, it's less likely than we previously thought in the last few weeks that we're going to raise interest rates next month in September. You think? <laughs> what a joke. <clears throat> what a joke. I believe that's, I believe that, you know, on one level, on a very superficial level, because I don't really think in this way, it makes for good narrative uh, discourse and banter and back and forth. On one level, how convenient is it for the Federal Reserve now in the U.S., our, our central bank, whatever you think of it, to not, they have a convenient excuse or reason, whatever it is, I have no, no, I'm not implying any connotation here, to not need to raise interest rates sooner rather than later in light of what's happened in the last week. The fragility of the equity sector in the world, not just here in the United States, would be reason sufficient to, uh, we need more time to determine whether or not we, it is appropriate to create or bring about a rate hike in, in the cost of money. How convenient. I don't know. So, I because I don't know what that means. That's that that is that is implicit. That is that carries all sorts of vague ambiguity uh, and baggage. And so, meanwhile, the world of traders, if you choose to be in that group, will on a non, in a nonstop way carry on a discourse about the meaning of what happened today, yesterday what will happen next week, tomorrow, in every given market to the extent. And that's a good that's a good thing if it is, uh, but it may not necessarily increase your edge. I got in this business for one reason, and that's to extract as much edge so that I can make as much, take as much money out of the market as often as possible, period. The beauty of speculation, to broaden the context for a second, get off topic for a moment, is that there is one rule as I see it, my metric is, oh, no sound. Thank you, Rich. Do we have sound now? No sound. Speakers. Okay, good. Excellent, guys. All right. Hopefully that was just a momentary, uh, all right, good. The, I was saying that the beauty of speculation, uh, if for me at least, is that there are no rules. 
uh, other than the one that I uh, brought to the table with it 34 years ago, and that is take as you know ramp up and maximize your equity curve uh, uh, motion up it uh, you know ramp up the rate at which you accelerate and achieve your individual profit objectives. How you do that, there's no limitations, there are no restrictions, anything is open, and so there are no bad ideas, in, in, unless they are. But at least, potentially, you want to, there are no restrictions on how you go about doing what you, uh, achieving your objectives. All right, so let's get to the nitty gritty here. I just drew in these lines to show those of you, or, you know, some obvious wave structure, if you want to utilize the Elliott paradigm as, a, as an attractor. That's, that's if this top here, yeah, this is the dollar yen. You can look at it in terms of both the price of the dollar or the value of the dollar or the path of the dollar or the price of the yen. Doesn't matter. This is I could have if you turn the chart upside down, you have a mirror image. You're looking at the Japanese yen. What I'm showing here is the dollar stated in in yen terms. That's all. By the way, this was a time target. This vertical line for the yen, we caught, uh, we it projected. Uh, I think we were a day ahead of the actual top here. This is my next time target for the yen. It's actually, I didn't feel like typing this in last night, it's a window between September 1st, which is Tuesday, and 9-4. I expect a reversal. If I put that together with an obvious wave structure, if this is 1, 2, this is the waterfall decline, so the characteristic of third waves, look at what's happening here. And a, a little move, a little retracement, that's your fourth wave. I would submit possibly, that might be, I don't know for certain, but I'm, I got a price model, which is Elliott, a very robust descriptive model. Ah, no sound again, folks? Do we have sound? Okay. Okay, good. All right, and I can see a possible dovetailing or reconciliation or congruency between how I see in the, you know, through the present, the market price action and how that might reconcile with my theoretical projected time point. And then if that and then if it does turn, as it moves up into it, my at least initial assumption it's going to change at the projected point in time, the window between step one and step four. If so, the, the wave model suggests what occurred that would mark the ending po quite possibly of the correction wave four and simultaneously of the onset of the impulsive wave five. So if I'm on the sidelines right now in either the US dollar and or the Japanese yen or the dollar yen forex spot pair, whatever, I have, if I'm not in a position now, I at least have a setup that I can evaluate and have some degree of anticipation greater than average to expect I've got a good potential value area. And I'll watch as I get closer to that window. As we approach next Tuesday, the first, I'll be waiting for indications on a micro level, be it divergence, be it a, uh, a moving average cross, all that stuff that everybody, you know, tech 101, that you read about when you're first learning how to trade. If you're a beginner, you learn that stuff. And if it's, and you create your foundation. This is stuff I'm looking at now that we can look at. And I submit all of this pattern, this attractor, the reason the market moved down here creating wave one, the move, reason it had a deep retracement as wave twos typically do, are is to flush out the, the, the smaller pocketed traders so that you can have a, a, a big move like this. The reason the market moves so far and so quickly and so with such great volatility in what we call in a model that makes sense to us at a very superficial level, Elliott wave, wave three, Elliott called it wonders to behold, that's why it moved like that, is because it was promulgated and propagated primarily by big institutional money. Why? Where, because this move right here from this bottom up to this top wiped out the small traders that analytically had it right. They took the basic course, Tech 101. They understood that the market should have been going down. Theoretically, they had it right. But a large percentage of them got stopped out here because they don't have a lot of funds in their account. If they're not present because they got, just got shell-shocked, by their stops getting hit, who's left to move the market? And who can push it and market their short position in the U.S. By, by, because they have size, the big money? Whether it's an individual entity, whether it's a central bank, whether it's a set, a set of central banks acting in concert, that's why you have, that's why at a deeper level, well, actually that's not even the deepest level, but that's a little more, that's not quite the surface level. 
The surface will tell you that it has to do, the reason this thing happened is something to do with what's going on in, in Shanghai stock market or the fact that, uh, uh, yeah, that's because that's what we see on the surface. That's the narrative. And on that level, it makes sense. But if you stay on that superficial level, you'll always be one or two steps behind. I'm not saying you can't ever get it right. You know, luck has its place. Every now and then, this complicated system will throw you a monetary bone to keep you coming back for more, you know, to, to provide the liquidity for the special subset of traders. I'm just, this is the reality of the markets, folks. When I first started at 24 years old, I heard that, you know, whatever it is, 20, 30 percent of traders consistently make money. 70, 80 percent of traders don't. So where do you want to be? Do we want to be in the 20 or 30 percent or in the 70 or 80? So if you follow, I'm not saying, I, and by the way, folks, I'm not, I'm not dissing the news or fundamental approaches or saying don't ever watch the news. I don't. I did when I first started because you play, you utilize the tools that you have. I'm simply saying when you, by virtue of understanding numerical relationships, it will enable you to see and cut through the complexity and make sense and, and clarify a lot of the confusion. Fair and even, uh, you know, the more numerical analysis you incorporate and utilize, the more clarity you'll typically on average get and achieve and understanding. So this is a trade, folks, just a very practical time without going into more detail. This is, uh, you know, I could go expand on this one chart for hours, but just if you, if I didn't, this, you know, if I disregard, if I am oblivious to what the news says, I would, the news is shaped and will be determined by this. The news doesn't determine this, this determines the news. I can reverse engineer, I can at least in a generic sense have in advance some idea of what's going to happen between September 1st and September 4. I don't know exactly the particulars, but I know it will be, a, it will be consistent and congruent with anything that would cause a topping out in US dollar and a decline in dollar. So next week, that's the type at least generically of news I can expect. And if I hear it, I know, aha, the underlying reason. We are at a point in time and price if we achieve this price target. I haven't talked about the price target. I've worked that out as well. I just want to, I don't have time to get into all of this. But if I see information, if I be in a peripheral sense or directly understand or hear about events in the world uh, flow of information, and we are constantly bombarded with it, moment by moment. That's the pro that's a problem. It, it adds to the complexity. We're overwhelmed with information. A hundred years ago was the dearth and scarcity of information. Today, everything is traveling at double the you know at light speed plus or a fraction thereof, and that creates added confusion. Cut through that by virtue of numerical analysis is the premise of today's presentation. All right. So this is a trade. If it just based on that, I haven't talked about an oscillator. I'm not saying you shouldn't look at oscillators. I'm not, I haven't talked about Bollinger Bands. I haven't talked about anything other than this. I've got a, a timeline here, and I also have a price situation. Well, if you understand the Elliott model. By the way, this if you understand the, the perfection, there's a rule. Well, there is actually not a rule. There used to be, but that's a separate issue. I don't want to get into the nuances of Elliott. But notice where this, the high for today is. Notice why the, it's, there, or this is last night I printed this out. Okay, the market's kind of up today a little bit more. Just I didn't have time to replace the slide, but it's more or less the same, basically. But this is textbook structure. Does it always, does it guarantee it will generate a profit for you? No. Remember the Sierpinski triangle. It is the attractor. We have a finite guarantee. I know exactly where the solution will lie. And so for, from the standpoint, of, let me state it just in terms of time. It will, the market will turn. I am, I, I assign or establish 95% probability. This thing is going to stop going up and start going down between September 1st and September 4th. That's my range. It's finite. Now, the infinite amount of possibility infinite possible solutions are what create the, the 
more precise. Sometimes I'll get it more precisely. Sometimes I'll get it less accurate or less precisely. I'm not sure if it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But to narrow it down within that window, sometimes I get it more pre a, a, a smaller window. Sometimes it's a little wider window. But to have at least I have a uh, I understand where the window is and its rate of closure, and I know how to apply it. Other situ if I didn't have these numerical insights. I would, I, I would, I don't know. I take away the lines, take away these guideposts, these concierges, but that guide me through this forest of complexity. And good luck with that. Oh, next slide. Oh, I skipped. This is a similar situation. Dollar, but looked at juxtaposed to the Swiss. Dollar Swiss, or I could look at the Swiss franc. Or if you're an equities trader, you can do an ETF that maps effectively and is liquid enough to follow Swiss franc prices. Curiously enough, Swiss, there's an interesting correlation between inflation, the value of the Swiss franc, and, of all things, soybean prices. That's just an inner market correlation. I'm just want to, and, and there may be a reason for it based ultimately that has its origin with prime numbers. On the surface, if you don't think about it that abstractly, you'll, you may understand it. It'll work. The principle works even if you don't. I, I can watch TV if I, even if I don't understand the mechanics of electron, uh, you know, the electrons uh, from a cathode ray tube impacting the phosphor, the, the, the film on a, on a screen. Some of these concepts work even if you don't know why they don't work. They, the con that doesn't negate the concept sometimes. Uh, often, from a psychological standpoint, isn't it helpful to have confidence if you under, you, it, you can embolden and increase your degree of confidence in a methodology or in a relationship or in a model to the extent you understand the mechanics and the reasoning and the logic and the pr theoretical premises of that model. I am simply saying that a lot of it at the, at the deepest level has to do with numerical or numbers in particular, primes more particularly. Same structure. I didn't create the strike. This is one or the start of one. This is your end of one. This is correction two. This is your three and we're moving up in wave four. I have a different time target for the dollar with respect to the Swiss franc. August 29. Curiously, today's the 27th. The 29th is two days from now. That's Saturday. What do you do when a market should turn if you believe and if it does turn on a weekend or time when the market's not trading? That will happen. Financial markets don't know anything about the fact that as a rule of thumb, as a rule of the playing field of the game that the humans have set up on planet Earth, we, do, we shut down and stop their flow. We, we, we say we stop their flow on a day on, such as Saturday. Market doesn't understand that. It just flows. It, it moves from one price level. The energy adjusts, and we call that energy. We have names for it dollar Swiss, or we give it a price level, or we assign it a value. If it's an agricultural commodity, dollars and cents per bushel, or if it's the price of gold, dollars and cents per ounce. It's energy. Money is a form of energy. In any case, I anticipate a continued rise in price through the, well, through August 29, since the, and a change of that energy uh, uh, trajectory and pathway when it reaches this turning point. Why is that, an, why will it change? It's a harmonic point. And I'm stating that harmonic, import, harmonic point meaning the energy reinforces. It, it's filling up. It's filling up so much that I've mentioned in a previous uh, programs and presentations, it can't contain, the container can no longer contain the amount of, of fluid or fuel. And when, where, it's, where has it got to go? In relative to the previous slide, when you have so much vibration and energy, when you have that conjunction, when the vector of the circle be, is overlaid perfectly on the horizontal vector and there is no space and you have something to contain in no space, and there are two ways that can occur or three ways. You can either decrease the space so that there is no space. Imagine, can, imagine simultaneously in a room the ceiling, the floor, and all four sides are closing in at a uniform rate so that eventually there is no space. Whatever is contained in that space, if there is anything, must go somewhere. Think about that. 
there is an infinite amount of counter pressure for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you have something in a finite space and then you gradually incrementally reduce the space so that there is zero space, the something that was present must go somewhere. In the it, there's an infinite response and it, so get back to this. On August 29, this is the harmonic point in time, stated in time. There's, a, there's another, I can state the harmonic point in terms of price, but let me keep it one variable at a time here. Something will happen, and it bursts, and it allows for change. The one type, of, the mechanism and the forces that were responsible for one type of motion will completely shut down because it explodes. It can, it stops, allowing for an altogether different type of motion. That's what you and I, or a trader, or a technician calls a top or a bottom. It's what an economist refers to as excess supply if it's a top, or a large amount of demand if it's a bottom. Same underlying energetic phenomena, a host of, new, of different perspective dis descriptions, on, depending on what level you want to look at it. If you go very, very, very deep, you drill down, I would submit to you that there are prime numbers responsible for me having worked out this date and this price. And if we see it, regardless, and, and so I submit by looking at that level, you have a deeper comprehension. You can get additional edge, which sometimes you can get at the more superficial levels, but often it's so it's ease of access because it's information, language, broadcasts are constantly around us. But the vagary of interpretation and the degree of possible or ambiguity that comes along with it is often counterproductive to your analysis. In any case, here's another trade. Okay, so what do you do since this is on a Saturday? You look, you start looking, whenever by principle, this is just a general trick or, or just the obvious, you look at the surrounding dates, Friday and Monday. So, folks, today is Thursday. I'm saying you start focusing on, if you're a futures or a derivative trader, you start looking at the Swiss franc. If you're a Forex trader, you look at this, pair, currency pair. If you're an equities trader, you look at, uh, what's an ETF? FXF, maybe. Anything that's liquid on the ETF as a fund that would be provide an appropriate liquid mapping of Swiss franc prices or U.S. dollar prices. You've got a trade right coming up in the next 48 to 72 hours, quite possibly. What are we going? Yeah, I think I think you get that, guys. All right. If not, there are questions. I'll be happy to address. Okay, using the bonds to forecast the stock market. This I just wanted. This is the same slide I had earlier in the presentation. Here's my time target for bonds, September 16th. Okay. My next time target. This, by the way, this one, this vertical. No, that's no. Take that back. That's the crosshairs. This is just the harmonic, but. What I uh, just picking up on a point I was making earlier, to the ex bonds nominal bond prices and interest rates tend to be inverse. All other, if we were to fix all other variables that impact and inform nom the the motion and behavior of the bond market or treasury bond in this case, this is a September bond market chart. All right, they the when interest rates rise, nominal bond prices decline. When interest rates fall, non uh, bond prices tend to go up. I have been maintaining for the last month or so that the bond market, at least, is one entity in their universe, does not believe the Fed will raise rates anytime soon. Why? Since the bottom that came in on right here, June 26, I didn't mark the date, but that's what it was, it's in my head, uh, has been overall rising, even though the last few days it came down after we hit the top on Monday. And I submit it's that having reached this bottom Monday, we're going to move up. We are actually right around the same level. Again, right before I tuned in for the presentation today, the bond price was around uh, 156 or so. So if we look on the scale here, it's, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's up a little bit today. This was printed out last night. The bonds about an hour or so ago were at 156 and change. So we've moved up already. I expect it will continue to move up into or around the, in anticipation of what the market internally believes the Fed will do or not do in this case. I don't. I believe by virtue, if we see continued appreciation in for the next two weeks or into the mid part of next month, September, which is my next time target for which I expect a change possibly in the trend in bond in nominal bonds. Uh, the fact that it moving is moving up is an indication that the bonds, at least as a sector of our economy, does not expect the Fed to raise interest rates. If it did, it would be coming down. Now, granted, it has come down 
uh, based on what the events of the last week, I believe this is going to hold as a support. This and this level in price, <clears throat> remember that's 155, represents an important uh, fifth. That's the perfect fifth of from that bottom. And this to my price target up here, which is 166, represents the complementary uh, uh, perfect fourth that will need to occur. And I submit that quite possibly will, uh, from a time perspective, move us into the you know another two weeks or so into the middle of next month. But just as a forecasting intermarket correlation, the fact that if that for, if what I just said, if my projection is accurate, it also adds, it does, it's not definitive by itself, but it is a intermarket relationship that enables me to have or engenders a higher degree of confidence that I expect the Fed will not raise rates if I want to talk topically in the narrative of traders this sooner rather than later. I've been saying for months I don't expect the Fed will raise interest rates until 2016. Here is a more specific technical or chart reason why I don't expect that to occur, assuming we see continued appreciation for the next two weeks. Overall, I'm not saying it's going to go up day by day by day. It might, but it, that's less likely to occur. But overall, I expect the trend to persist. This little move from this top that came in Monday through here, or excuse me, last week through here, this was Monday's, this was Monday, uh, I, I think is just a retracement within the broader move that started here at the bottom. And I can, I expect a resumption of that uptrend more or less through the middle of, through this time point. And here's the stock market, the last chart. Ninth, I, we projected weeks, if not months ago, uh, a, this, this vertical line here is, was the, uh, my last most recent October 19. That was one day after the top uh, but for which wave three began in the stocks. That's why the market came down from an, a, a, a little deeper level. It's not ultimately, it's not telling you specifically which primes were responsible for that, which Fibonacci, which numbers, but ultimately it was a, num a numerical process very, very at very deep levels that had to do with the amount of time elapse from important previous turning points or points where the energy of the system got so overflow so much that it couldn't contain and it had to break out and the breaking out disrupted the previous motion allowing for a very violent reaction and thus the fall. On a more topical level as stated in terms of Elliott attractor it was the time for the wave three to begin and we had a classic third wave. Curiously enough one of the tenets of the Elliott principle is that when th and, and remember Elliott said third waves are wonders to behold. Now, that's quite a narrative. I would, sub I would submit a lot of analysts uh, and traders at large would admit it just the natural response to what we've seen in the last week in stock prices here in the U.S. as well as worldwide. Ah, it was breathtaking. What a decline. Many tra some traders may have been caught off guard. Some traders may not have been. If, you know, this is the, this is the top on May 19th right here, this little top. This is exactly the same top stated in price June 20th. That's a double top, perfect double top. You can pick either one, pick your poison as to which one is the wave one. This might be one, correction two, this is wave three. The main, this is the third of the third. I projected theoretically back here somewhere, back in May, we would have a turn on August 19. As it turned out, I was one day late. The actual precise top was the, was the 18th, okay? My next theoretical top, or excuse me, turning point for the equity sector, I utilize the S&P as my proxy for broad equity price activity in, at large, 922. Curiously, that's one day before the autumnal equinox. We tend to see on the quarterly calendars, financial markets, bonds, interest rates, stock markets, etc., currencies also, all the financial markets tend more or less in a very broad sense. So I don't think this is coincidence necessarily that my theoretical price Project, or excuse me, time projection for the equity sector in the U.S. is 9.22. If you ask me at this moment in time, right now, given everything I know, do I expect 9.22 to correspond with a top or a bottom? I'm not certain. So what if I, to the extent I have some, it's not quite clear, I watch the trajectory of price action as we get more and more proximal to 9.22. And then I make a beginning, I, I begin to uh, tip the balance of directional perf preferred projection based on other more uh, micro, lesser important, you know, things like divergence, what's going on. But more or less, I have a roadmap as to what I can expect. 
I expect, I don't know how exactly the market's going to move. We still have, that's a few weeks from now. But I do know this, something of importance. I have a similar degree of confidence. I had over 92% uh, probability expectation the market would change on or around August 19. In this case, I came in one day late. Sometimes I'm to the day. Sometimes I'm to the minute if I'm a day trader using other tools that are fractal or scaled versions of the same models that I utilize to enable this. So similarly, but I don't have at this moment a, a keen sense for which I have great confidence whether it will manifest as a top or a bottom. I'm not sure. I will attempt to make finer and fine, to get that clarified as I get closer and closer. As you get closer and closer, you get more information, enabling a finer understanding of what's more likely to occur on the spectrum of probabilities. Also, one other point I wanted to, it has nothing to do with our stuff, but just generally for your interest here and background. I, I was telling people, so notice the bottom here. This is Monday's bottom. Notice where it is. This is an important bottom historically, October 15, 2014, this bottom here, in all indexes. And not only in all stock indices, a lot of different financial markets had either an important bottom or top on that date, specifically, precisely October 15, last year, 2014. And that's part of the reason why the market, it didn't get there. It, it, was feel, it was beginning to feel the supportive impact of that historical price point or energy point, if we want to think about it in more abstract, truer terms. However you think of it, it's the same end result. And as long as that bottom hell holds, notice we're still higher. We're, and then, by the way, the market's up today. This was printed out last night. And I expect, well, I'm not sure. So that some traders have been asking me all for the last week, what do we, what do, we do with the stock market? Well, if you're if you got short, get out of your short. Um, if you're not in it, if you're on the sidelines, I'm not quite sure. I have a trade in the bonds, I have a trade in beans, I have a trade in energy. So, but I will have a trade in all probability come on, as we approach 9:22. All right. Let's time for questions, uh, folks. Go, please. Sound is good. All right, let's see what question we have. You don't know if the yes will be a top or a bottom? No. I had previously, uh, I'd, let me uh, clarify that. Um, I have my thoughts, but I don't know for sure. I don't have this, I might have a 67% uh, expectation. I have a 92, 93% probability that it's the market will change and turn on or around 922. Similar to what I had uh, proposed for August 19. I was a day off on that. Even on August 17 last week or whenever that was, I think it was a, uh, last Monday, I still did wasn't certain as to the direction. I was actually at the beginning of last week expecting the market to move higher, not lower. I did not expect the, in spite of the, you know, I could, have, I could have list six things uh, that are critical from a technical viewpoint to support a bullish view for the stock market a week ago, let's say last Monday, let's just say, and six things, six in one hand, six in half in a dozen. One supporting the argument for higher prices, another supporting lower prices. So to the extent, you know, I always tell traders, trade a contingency, do a strangle uh, from a practical strategic standpoint. But What's important is that I had an understanding, I was expecting something critical to happen last week, given my projected time point of 9, or excuse me, 8, 19. It came in a day earlier. So I'm not surprised about that. So I don't, the answer to your question, uh, do I know, do I expect, uh, Gary or whoever's asking, do I expect this to be uh, on 9.22 a top or bottom? I'm not sure, because I was, I was leaning towards expecting higher prices into the, I was initially a week ago or last week, not a week ago today because the market had started to decline, but last, at the beginning of last week from Monday through Wednesday, I had a bias to expect higher prices into the September timeframe. I thought the ultimate top uh, for which we would get the waterfall decline that we've seen in the last week would commence on the 922 date. Now that it's occurred, a cycle, if you, it's, uh, it, it occurred at a, a kind of a wavelength earlier than I expected. I'm not quite certain what to expect in terms of the directionality. I do, ex again, as I get closer and closer, depending on how the market moves between now and then, I'll get a keener sense as to whether to go long or go short, how to play it strategically. But yeah, I, right now, if you ask me, I'm not certain. I do, 
I don't think, again, just if, you know, fundamentals to the extent uh, they, you know, we can kind of get in, some in, in, infer something from what's going on with the Fed, the central bank. I don't, I'd be very surprised to see, again, on that, on this very topical level, I don't think the bank is going to raise rates starting next month. Again, I, for the record, I don't believe that they will raise interest rates till 2016 for various reasons. The fact that the markets already, again, had a crash from last week through today gives them a convenient reason to cite concerning the fragility of our economy, citing that as one. Now, at the same time, I read something this morning about jobless claims are down. So there's, a, there's an admixture of information. GDP is uh, revised up from 2.3 to 3.7 percent. So that's strong. And that would be in a, a potential uh, set of information that might provide the motivation, be more inclined to raise rates. But I, in the scheme of things, overall, given all the analysis and everything that I think is integral and critical to what is going to occur, I don't expect at least central bank policy to be hawkish. I expect, I expect them to continue their dovish stance through, or at least until 2016. Folks, I guess if that's it, hopefully you got something if you provide, uh, we have recorded today's presentation. If you'd like additional uh, uh, review, or if there's, uh, you'd want to just hear it if you missed it. Um, uh, from time to time, they offer the, all the um, the marketing and the agreements in terms of people who want to work with me or any one of my coworkers. Uh, talk to Peter Newman. Peter Newman is the person who heads our admission and the business. Uh, side of and uh, constructs the contractual arrangements so he is and he works with me specifically as well as the other mentors and he is kind of like our dean of uh, setting this up uh, so he would be the person if you contact us at 800-339-8588 that can tell you the details of some of the programs every now and then when some students come in and I think I'm nearing I think I have 13 students that I'm talking or traders that I work with now I probably could handle a two or three more, but I'm not sure, but I usually don't want to, it gets a little unwieldy for my schedule to handle more than that, but he would be the person, he keeps tabs on that, and then I kind of intuitively kind of have a sense of that myself. But from time to time, they have raffles just to, to entice you to take, obviously, uh, look, look more closely at some of the programs. We have a spectrum of different mentors. I do technical. I work with, I've worked over the years with pure beginners. I've worked with experts. I do options, short-term trading, day trading. Um, long-term trading, investing, all of the above. Uh, the only thing that I don't have expertise in currently, and an interesting ir ironic aspect of about what I'm about to say is I started my career. I don't teach fundamental approach. I started there, the, the fundamental approach. I started my career there. The very first book I read was Fundamental Analysis by Benjamin Graham. It's the kind of the Bible of the fundamental approach, but that was more than 30 years ago. So uh, I could still do it, but I'd have to beef up in how to do it, and it's not infrastructurally it just doesn't it's not consistent with what I do in my own accounts to this day so if you'd like to know more about the details of our programs and the specifics of our approaches mentor by mentor con you have the contact information uh, when I sign off in a moment there is a think a form you can fill out so that it would enable you can be um, privy to the discount if I guess uh, if that's what they're running now at the at our home office. Uh, but again, hopefully you've got something out of this, and if you need more information concerning specifics on the program, the topic of, uh, you know, the importance of market math and numbers in particular, uh, and or anything related to that, uh, you know how to reach us given the contact information on the screen. Uh, the person, again, that would provide the more most directly is on would be Peter Newman. So if you hear from him, or if you proactively reach out to us to find out what we do, Great, thank you, uh, Vij, VJ. Um, uh, thanks for your appreciate for your thanks. And uh, but yeah, you have the contact information, and Peter Newman is the person that would facilitate learning more about what we do. So it's been. Uh, hopefully, guys, you got something out of it. And until the next presentation, I wish you a great day and happy and profitable trading in the days and weeks and months to come. Until next time.